The Ben Heck Show is brought to you by Element 14, the electronic design community where you can connect and collaborate with top engineers from around the world. Join now at element14.com. So last week, Ben built this wonderful Xbox One S laptop, but because he was short on time, he didn't play any games, he just played a Blu-ray for you guys. So now I'm gonna take some time, get my game on. Uh, Max went to the store, picked up ReCore, so we're gonna test it out. Still loading. <laughs> it's not installing, it's just loading the game now. This would never happen with a Nintendo 64. Just saying. I could have been like Adult Link by now in Ocarina of Time. Oh, 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 cutscene. What's that crashed looking ship slash satellite slash space station? You know, there's a lot of snow around and she's like sleeveless and sunburned. Sweet. Yep. I want an exo frame. That's pretty cool. Oh, look, flying bugs. Should I be like worried about these things? Oh god. Oh gosh. Find it for me, Mac. Is it okay? Hey. Woohoo! Quit trying to steal my dog. Well, that was fun. This seems like an interesting game. I might have to play more of it later. But for now, back to the episode. Hello and welcome back to the Ben Heck Show. Karen, I see we have a new person here today. Yes, this is my friend, Abby. Hey, how's it going? Going good. She has a project that she wanted us to work on. Oh, what is it? I woke up at my friend's house and okay. there was a pachinko machine there staring me in the face. Oh, that's kind of weird. Yeah. Did you think you were like still dreaming or something? I didn't have my glasses on. I didn't know what the heck it was. It was, was just like, beautiful ah. and colorful and I didn't know. I, I had to look this up. So a pachinko machine is this mechanical Japanese game, kind of like a gambling, almost like vertical pinball kind yeah, of thing. Yeah. yeah. And the balls are uh, like what, half inch looks like? Yeah. Is it all like ball bearings? Yeah. 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 So then what happened? So then I saw it and I was like, why do you have this? And he he had gotten it for free from somebody else. Okay. And so I, he's like, it doesn't work. Do you want it? Yes. And so then I called Karen right away because yeah, I needed this. We needed it to work. We needed to fix it. So we don't know if it works. Yeah, does it work? Um, but it's completely mechanical. So I think we can probably figure out how it works. And if it's broken, I'm not worried. I'm sure we can replace any switches or... We could 3D print parts if they're missing. Exactly. Yeah. So, and then once we get the mechanical part working, we can add some bells and whistles, ah. maybe replace the lights with some LEDs. Well, if there's switches in it that turn on the light bulbs, we could turn those into logic switches and then add voice and sound effects and music. We could use that same driver board we used on the Hackmanji game. Oh, that's a good idea. Yeah. So we can take this 1970s pachinko machine and bring it into the modern era, or at least the mid-2000s. Sounds good. <laughs> Let's get started. Amazing hacks. Where are my dragons? Inspired designs. Oh, look, I knocked some hot glue loose. Regrettable acting. I want to live in a world with Star Wars again! Each week, Element 14's The Ben Heck Show brings you innovative projects using electronics, engineering, and more. Should be enough balls, but you can keep, just load them all in there. All right, so let's see. This should load a ball. There it goes. So we want to get into one of these five, one, two, three, four, five spots, right? Yes. And this, is that a crab? What is that thing? A uh, crab butterfly? Isn't that some like ancient... Oh, 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 wait, wait for it. Yes! Pachinko! So where did the... It's like Jenga. <laughs> you just yell pachinko? I don't know. Is, that's the hopper for the jackpot ball. Yeah, right? so there's, there's a hopper back here that has I don't know, maybe like a dozen or 20 balls in mm -hmm. it, and that you win right. when you when you get into one of those five slots. Okay. But yeah, if you want to, if you're like, I'm done, or if you like get them stuck because you did something silly, right. you can push this, and it releases them down here, so you can oh. apparently more easily grab them out than from here because they eventually get stuck in this area, and you can't reach all of them. Yeah. All right, Ben, rapid play. Do all it, right. do it. If you have a gambling problem, call 1-800-BETS-ALL. Oh wow! Woo! Yeah, two jackpots, I should keep playing. 
Uh, if you look back here, Karen, mm -hmm. if you get into one of the um, jackpots, instead of dumping through the machine out into the house bucket here, the ball comes down here and it hits this lever. So this lever, see? Yeah. that's the uh, jackpot lever. After we figured out how the machine worked, we cleaned it up a bit. Karen shined up the front of the unit while I replaced lights in the back. Once this was done, it was time to brainstorm where we were going to put the switches. We will be able to use these switches to detect different states in the game, such as success or failure. This is the launch lever mechanism. Karen, can you bring it down? Now release it. Okay, so that's what happens when you launch. Mm -hmm. I was thinking we could have a sound effect for when you launch the ball. So we could take this switch. Mm -hmm. I mean, we'd have to put a little bit of an adapter on it, but just to test it out. So we could do this. So we could have it press it against it like that. So it's closed. When it opens up, open it. The system's like, oh, it's about to launch. And then when it closes again, it triggers a sound effect. So it'd be like, pew, pew or like maybe a cannon firing or a gun or something or a whip or so you know some fire yeah that could work well i might as well just mount the switch okay so when a ball drains it comes out this uh flap here so i was thinking that we could add a switch that would detect when the ball comes through so i have a uh, low force micro switch here problem is we, I think we need more than just the wire in order to detect it. I mean, the ball might hit it, but I'm not sure how reliable that would be. What I think I'm gonna do is I will 3D print a little flap that will clip onto these wires so the ball has no choice but to hit it and open it in this direction. I can't make the flap too thick though, otherwise it'll weigh down the switch and cause a false positive. Yeah, but if I add that, we should know every possible state of the machine and detect success and failure. I 3D printed this little plate. Let's put the switch in place. Make sure the clips stay on. All right, let's drop it through the fail slot and see if we hear a beep. Beauty! All right, that definitely registers. Uh, I think I'll print bottom for it just to make sure that it stays closed. But I think we can add a cap without too much difficulty. And then we'll bolt it in place. Karen is trying to find some cool music and sound effects for the pachinko machine. In the meantime, I'm gonna start working on the electronics. So this machine does two things basically. It has lights and it's also going to have sound. So I grabbed this Atari Jaguar power supply that I have lain around from all those years ago when for some reason I made an Atari Jaguar portable. So we've got this um, single board audio amplifier. I think this will work well. We have a lot of old boom boxes laying around like that Sony one we took apart for the Sony Nintendo prototype. So we should be good there. So I had my friend send me another one of these. This is a prop dev stick. It's a microcontroller that can do audio and it has a SD card built into the board. And this is the same thing we used to run the Hackmanji game that we made a few months ago. So we can actually just use the Hackmanji audio code for this project. So I put some headers on it, as you can see, and I like to put the headers in place and then solder it. That way the headers are all nice and straight in the way they need to be. So when we're controlling things like lights, you know, you may be familiar with hooking up LEDs to your Arduino, but if you're having higher powered LEDs or, or brighter lights, you need to have a little bit more external control on that. So what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna wire up a bank of transistors so we can control higher powered lights using the lower power microcontroller. This particular microcontroller is 3.3 volts. Um, so I mean, you could put 3.3 volts into a light, but you really shouldn't. Uh, microcontrollers have uh, not just a voltage rating on the pins, but a current rating, like what they can source or sync. It's usually around 20 milliamps. So while that will light up a regular LED, like a five millimeter LED, it's not really useful for anything beyond that as far as power consumption. That's why you want external circuitry to do it. So uh, I have a bunch of 2N4401 NPN transistors here. These are pretty common. So we'll do a test to make sure this work. I, I believe they will. So we can pump 12 volts into the lights and then control it with a 3.3 volt microcontroller. Now these uh, particular uh, bayonet style 44, 42 bulbs are rated at 6.3 volts. But what we'll do is we'll actually duty cycle them. They'll only be on half the time. I mean, you won't be able to see it, but they'll be basically flickering which will reduce the overall voltage, allowing them to work properly without being burnt out. I mean, you can stick 12 volts into it. Let me show you. It doesn't, it doesn't burn up, but you don't want to do that long term when they're supposed to be six volts. So that's 12 and dial it down to six. Now these particular bulbs, 
are meant to be um, AC or DC. So there's actually bridge rectifiers inside of them. So the um, polarity doesn't matter. That's great and all, but since there's a bridge rectifier, that means we have a diode drop. A little bit of voltage is lost when you go through the diode. So we have to take that into account. But I think if we pulse these at 12 volts, they should be just fine. Because sometimes in machines, you'll have these actually in a 24 volt power supply and they'll be in an eight by eight matrix. So you've got 24 volts, but it's divided by eight. So you're looking at more like, what is that? It doesn't really divide evenly, does it? No, three volts, yeah, each. So yeah. We should, uh, we should be able to make this work. So I'm gonna get this board wired up and then we'll start adding transistors. I wanna mount this PCB on the inside of the pachinko machine, probably against a piece of plastic that we can drill into safely. So I wanna think about where everything is. So if you have the programming cable, I want that to come out the side. Then we'll probably have these little headers here that the lights will plug into. So probably have those maybe at the top. So we'll have 12 volts coming in, then we'll have the headers, then we'll have the transistors, the resistors, and then the board. So I need to think about where everything is when I lay it out. So why don't we do this for starters? We'll just wire up one transistor to make sure it works, and then we we can wire up the rest. So when we do, uh, when you use an MPN transistor, you usually sync the current into it. So you source the current to the LED. So you have the 12 volts going into the LED and then, well, the negative of the LED would go down into the collector of the MPN transistor. Then when you energize the base, it syncs through the emitter. These transistors should be fine. I guess I can double check their values, but I would think they'd be able to do 12 volts. I mean, we could use um, the higher power Darlington transistors, but I don't think we really need to. All right, let's try wiring it up. So we'll have a uh, common voltage going into all of the uh, lights. So we'll have the voltage coming in there and then it will drain there. So what we'll do is we'll just take the transistor like that. So we have our light. I'm gonna plug it in here and we'll attach 12 volts here, then ground. I've also got the ground connected to this battery pack. This battery pack, it's got two AA, so that'd be three volts. So this will act as our microcontroller just for this test. I'm gonna turn on the power supply, 12 volts. Okay, so the light's not doing anything. So when I put three volts here into the resistor, it should activate the transistor and turn on the light. Yay, cool. All right, now that we know it works, I can hook up more of these for all the possible lights. I think we have four lights. There are four lights. Maybe hook up six just in case we want to add something. So I'll get that circuit hooked up and then we can hook it up to the microcontroller and try controlling it with a program. I hooked up six transistors and six ports so that we have lots of options. And we have a 12 volt input port here. So I just hooked up the 12 volt rail to the input of the lights and also the ground. And now I'm going to solder in our microcontroller and then attach the IO to it. And then we should be able to start controlling these with the microcontroller. We can do some simple tests with the computer. Um, yeah, and then once I know how much space I need, I'll probably just cut the circuit board in half so I can use it for something else. Uh, I also need a regulator because we got to go from 12 volts down to 3.3 for this board. There's a switching circuit on this. So if you plug in USB, it'll power the uh, microcontroller off USB. But if it's not connected, then it'll power off the voltage input pin. Should work. Actually, the um, regulator that's on here might work as is. I guess I'll just have to check, but I'll get it wired in for starters. Let's do a test. I'm going to hook up 12 volts here using my bench supply. Now I'm gonna plug the microcontroller in with this USB port. Now this is being powered right now by the regulator, the five volt regulator here, but there's a circuit on this microcontroller board that if power is present on the USB rail, then it will use the USB rail instead of this. All right, so I've got a couple lights here, plug two of them in just so we can see the sequence. So I just did a really quick test program where we're gonna rake zeros and ones across the uh, output. We should be able to see the lights change. There we go. All right, so we can just check, make sure they all work. That one doesn't seem to be working. Let's try this one. That one works. That one works. That one works. So the third one doesn't work. All right, well, I'm sure it's just a simple thing. All right, now I'm gonna attach the audio header. Time for an overview of what I built. The 12 volt input here, this will be the same thing that is going to the audio amplifier. Got a capacitor for filtering that. Six lights with their transistor controls. Those are hooked up to the microcontroller here. Five volt regulator, takes a 12 volt, knocks it down to five, puts it into the microcontroller board. Audio output jack, this will also go to the audio amplifier. And then I have four, four switches hooked up because we have ball load good, launch switch, jackpot switch, and drain switch. So yes, all four. So that should be everything we need. So 
So I think this is ready to install into the unit. And once I hook up the switches, we can actually start programming. I've mounted the PCB to the plastic. Now I'm gonna wire up the lights and the switches. We did have this switch here, which is the load good switch. It's kind of beat up and messed up. So I might actually replace this one as well. It normally sits here and this lever pushes against it. Ugh, it's kind of gross. It doesn't even line up really. Well, in the meantime, I'll wire up everything else. So here we go. The two main things I need to wire up on the back of this unit are lights and switches. For each light and switch, I used a pair of wires that were longer than it needed to be. That way I could route them wherever I needed without getting in the way of other mechanical components. I used twist ties and adhesive tabs to put everything where it should be, and then I wired connectors so they could plug easily into the board. I finished wiring up the insides of the pachinko machine. So we have our power on light, our jackpot lights, and our shot ready light. And for switches, balls ready switch. This one I actually had to swap out because the existing switch was pretty poor condition. And then inside here, we have the jackpot switch. I've wired everything up to our driver board. So switches are here, lights are here. I have the uh, Jaguar power supply going into the main power switch, which goes to the microcontroller unit, and it's also gonna go to this amplifier. So Karen's going to decide where to put the speakers in, and I'm going to start testing everything and starting to write code because now we can detect everything that's happening with the machine. So I'm cutting a hole, using a hole saw to cut through the front of the machine, but I'm not gonna go all the way through because hole saws tend to cause some blow out through the back and then you get some really nasty chips. And so rather than having to do more cleanup work afterwards, I'm gonna cut part of the way through to the point where I have my drilled hole in the middle and then I'm gonna come back up from behind. So you can be careful, try to not make this too messy. Let's go over the flowchart one more time. Okay. You turn on the machine. And it goes, Pachinko! Okay, so it's gonna wait and see if there's enough balls loaded because there's a switch to detect that. Yep. If there aren't enough balls loaded, it would be like, first it'd be like, Pachinko! Please load balls. Load balls now. Load balls, please. Until enough balls are loaded. And then just start having like the, your door is ajar noise that's really annoying. Oh, or like boom, you haven't boom, put your seatbelts on, uh, car noise. I, like, oh. I think it should talk. And then once enough balls are loaded, it'd be like, Balls loaded. Enjoy. Anyway, so we call this the attract mode when it's waiting to start. And if there are enough balls loaded, it goes down to the game go state, in which case it waits for the launch lever to be pulled. Okay. The switch is normally closed. So when you pull the lever, it'll open the switch. So it could be like, and then when you let go of the lever, it'll close the switch again. So it'd be like, so, so when you pull the lever down, it starts the music. Yes. The first time. So that's what starts the game. Okay. So be like, and then when you release the lever, it goes. If you avoid pulling the lever for one minute, it assumes you're out of money, and then the music fades out and it goes back into the wait state. All right. So explain the fail state of the ball. So uh, there's one hole in the bottom where if you fail it goes out into there, but it's like ski ball where if you don't land in one of the cool jackpot like holes. It just drains out the bottom. It just bottom. drains out the bottom. And then it goes into the bucket inside the machine, which is the house balls. Yeah. Okay, and the other thing that can happen is you can get a jackpot. And then it goes dun da da or something. And the balls come out. And then it goes cha ching because that's what the sound makes with the bell. Okay, so this machine can be in three different states. State zero, when you turn on the machine, checks to see if there's balls. If there aren't any balls, it continually prompts you to pour balls into the trough. Please load balls. So these are the balls that the machine gives you as your jackpot. Now there's a switch that will get flipped as I load these balls, but we can't just trigger it when the switch closes because as we load the balls, the switch will get tripped a couple times. So what we do is if the switch is closed, we count for five cycles of the switch being closed. And if it's closed the entire time, then we assume the balls have come to a rest and then we proceed. Okay, so now we're in state one. State one, there's still no music, but it's waiting for us to use the launch lever. As soon as I pull the lever, it's gonna start the music. Okay, now we're in state two. This is the active game. And there's two things that can happen. The balls can get a jackpot or they can drain. So when I release the lever, the switch is going to close and give us a launch sound. So when you open and close the switch, its state may not be known. It might be in a state of flux. So what debounce does 
is it accommodates for that. So the switch opens and then we give it a little bit of time before we detect if it can close or not. Because if we don't do that, we hear false positive. We'd hear, we'd hear the load and the fire, like kind of on top of each other. By using timers and counters, we can make sure that we only sense the switch when it's in a known solid state. So we want the debounce to prevent false trigger points when the switch is opening and closing, but we also want it to be as fast as possible in case someone does like that. Not a single jackpot in all of this? Come on. Now there's a timeout on this. If enough cycles pass without the person pushing the lever, the music will fade out to prevent you from going insane. Yeah, it'll happen any day here. Oh, there it goes. Oh, well, everything's all right now, unless... <laughs> Just when you think the nightmare's over. So next up, I have to get the lights to respond. So we have ready light, system on light, and jackpot lights. And once I have the lights and the rest of the logic working, I can make different sound effects and add a selector button so you can select what kind of sound effects and music you'd like to listen to. I now have the lights hooked up. Let's switch it on. Okay, so this is the main power light, but if there aren't enough balls loaded, it'll flash. And this light pulses to let you know you can launch. When you, when you pull the launch lever, this one stays dark, and then when you release it, this one and this one go bright. Just to give a little, you know, a little bit of visual animation. And then these will flash, actually all four of them will flash, when you get a jackpot. I'm gonna cheat to get a jackpot. Okay, Abby, we have your pachinko machine improved and fixed and ready to go. All right, I'm gonna flip it on, ready? Yeah. All right, it's balls on. Balls loaded, enjoy. So will even tell you <laughs> if you need to load the balls or not. Okay. So you can select the different sound modes by tapping this button here. Why don't you see which one you like? Yeah, pick a, pick right, a mode. 8-bit right. mode. 8-bit mode? And once you're ready, mode. pull the lever and start right, launching balls. <laughs> Fart mode. Fart mode. <laughs> 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 got, got a jackpot, so I mean, maybe fart mode's it's good. It's got, it's got good music though. You hear it? Okay. Wait, wait. Fart mode's really good for getting the food. Oh my god! <laughs> You're doing really it's got, well. It's got yes, good music. Fart mode best. <laughs> It's making quite a mess. <laughs> <sighs> Actually, oh yeah, can I tell you, I saw one of these at a place on Willie Street for 180 bucks. Yeah, yeah, like I, I've seen this machine refurbished was like 600, I think. But how much do you think it'd be worth now that they can make fart noises? Um, this is pretty much priceless. Yeah. Yeah. Well, that's all the time we have for today. I think the pachinko machine rebuild turned out pretty well. Yeah, me too. Do you know of any mechanical games that would be really interesting to add electronics to? Let us know on the Element 14 community on element14.com forward slash tbhs. You can also go there to read about other upcoming episodes, builds, and special events. We'll see you next time. We're going to go play Pachinko. Should we do fart mode? Ape it mode. Um, fart mode. Fart mode. <laughs> <laughs>
Okay, music to part two. I think this would get, like be good to have. Yeah. Yeah. Ah, I hate Ghostbusters 2016. Oh my God, Rogue One is going to be the best movie ever. Ooh.